Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, one and all. Today, we are overjoyed to present to you A Christmas Carol, written by Charles Dickens, adapted by Marilyn Mattis. A Christmas Carol is a very old story, but a story we never grow tired of hearing. Mr. Dickens himself called it a ghost story of Christmas and said that he hoped it would haunt our houses pleasantly for many years to come. And haunt us pleasantly it has, even from Cobb Theater at Randolph-Macon campus for decades, where hundreds of cast members reading for dozens of roles came together over the years to tell this story of Christmas. Here and now, Mr. Dickens' ghosts will haunt us once more as we raise them to tell our story of Christmas yet again, in honor of the season and in memory of Marilyn, who, along with her husband Joe, helped bring the joy of this story to the Randolph-Macon and Ashland communities for years. We may not be on stage together, so the troupe of actors, the props and the costumes that you may be used to might be absent but the magic of the tale remains and will bring the story of mr dickens to life but i tarry too long you have come to hear and see a christmas carol and hear and see it you shall so i shall make my exit until at least my next entrance and let Mr. Dickens and his characters speak instead. Marley was dead, to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register's burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good for anything he put his hand to. Old Marley was dead as a doornail. Scrooge and he were partners for, I don't know how many years, Scrooge was a sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole friend, and sole mourner. And even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut up by the sad event, but that he was an excellent man of business and still able to drive a hard bargain on the very day of the funeral. The mention of Marley's funeral brings us back to the point we started from. There is no doubt that Marley was dead. This must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come of the story we are to relate. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Scrooge had never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood years afterward above the warehouse door, Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge, Scrooge. Good morning, Mr. Scrooge. And sometimes Marley. Good day, Mr. Marley. But he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire, secret and self-contained, and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. I saw three ships come sailing in on Christmas Day. Ah, be gone with you. Your racket keeps honest men from working. He carried his own low temperature always about with him. His very presence iced his office in the dog days and didn't thaw one degree at Christmas. And this Christmas, or Christmas Eve to be precise, was of course no exception. Old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house keeping his door open so that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who sat in a dismal call beyond. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal, a fire that could not be replenished, for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room, wherefore the clerk tried to warm himself with a candle, in which effort, not being a man of great imagination, he failed. Outside it was cold, bleak, and biting weather. And inside the counting house of Scrooge and Marley, bleaker still, when suddenly a cheerful voice cried, Good morning, uncle. God save you. It was Scrooge's nephew, his only living relative. Bah, 
Humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle. You don't mean that, I'm sure. Humbug, I say. Don't be cross, Uncle. What else can I be when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas. Out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older, but not a dollar richer. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled in his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Uncle! Nephew, keep Christmas in your way, and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then. Much good may it do you. Much good it has ever done you. There are many things from which I might have derived good, by which I have not profited Christmas among the rest. But I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time, apart from the veneration due to its sacred name and origin, if anything belonging to it can be separated from that, as a good time. A kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time the only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when women and women seem by one consent to open their shut up hearts freely and to think of people below them as as if they were fellow passengers to the grave and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. And therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. Let me hear another sound from you, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, Uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. Bah, good afternoon, sir. I want nothing from you, Uncle. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? I have work to do. Good afternoon, sir. I am sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute, but I'll keep my Christmas spirit to the last. So a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Bye. And a Happy New Year. Mm-hmm. Merry Christmas, Mr. Cratchit. And a Merry Christmas to you too, sir. There's another fellow, my clerk, with 15 shillings a week and a wife and family, talking about a Merry Christmas. I should retire to Bedlam. Ah, Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at this time. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts, sir. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. Oh, and, and the union workhouses. Are they still in operation? They are. I wish I could say they were not. Oh, well, the treadmill and the polar are in full vigor, then. Both are very busy, sir. Oh. I was afraid, from what you said at first, that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course. But since they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the multitude, a few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. What shall we put you down for? Nothing. You wish to remain anonymous. I wish to be left alone. Well, since you ask me what I wish, ladies, that is my answer. I don't make merry at Christmas, but I can't afford to make idle people merry. I pay taxes to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough. Those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and some would rather die. 
Well, if they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. It's not my business. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly now. Good afternoon, ladies. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to pursue their points, the ladies withdrew, and Scrooge resumed his labors with an approved opinion of himself. Meanwhile, the fog and darkness thickened, and at length, the hour of shutting up the counting house had arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his stool and tacitly admitted that fact to his clerk. Hmm. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing... Oh, you'll get nothing from me, you little beggar. Be gone with you. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose. If quite convenient, sir. Oh, it's not convenient. And it's not fair. If I were to hold back half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. And yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. It's only one day a year, sir. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. Uh, but I suppose you must have the whole day. Will you be here all the earlier the next morning? Yes, sir. Struge took his melancholy dinner and his usual melancholy tavern. And having read all the newspapers, he beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book and went home to bed. Out of my way, the you to block a man's passage with your worthless frivolities. Ah, humbug! Scrooge lived in the chambers that had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms. And lonely and dark on the clearest of nights. But Scrooge, of course, was not afraid of the dark. Darkness is cheap, and so he liked it. But something in the darkness this night left him ill at ease. A fancy? But Scrooge was not a fanciful man. Yet on this night... On this night, when Jacob Marley had died seven years before... Scrooge fancied he'd saw strange things in the dark. Old Marley's face upon the door knocker. Old Marley's face once again at the hearth. But Scrooge was not a fanciful man, so he just said, Pooh. And got himself ready for bed. Humbug. But before his head even touched the pillow, a strange thing happened. In the gloom, a bell began to ring. Softly at first, and then it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. This might have lasted half a minute, or a minute, but it seemed like an hour. Then the bells ceased as they had begun, together. They were succeeded by a clanking noise, deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over cast deep in the wine merchant's cellar. Scrooge remembered that he had heard those ghosts in haunted houses were described as dragging chains. The noise grew much louder, coming up the stairs, coming straight towards his door. It's humbug still. I won't believe it. His tune changed, though, when, without a pause, it came on through the heavy door and passed in the room before his eyes. How now? Thing? What do you want with me? March. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Well, who were you, then? You're particular for a shade. In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you sit down? I can. Well, do it then. You don't believe in me. I don't. You see me, you hear me. Do you not believe your own senses? I don't know. Our senses can be cheats. A slight disorder of the stomach can affect them. You may, you may be an undigested bit of beef, a, a blot of mustard, a, 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 a crumb of cheese, a, a fragment of underdone potato, 
<laughs> yes, there's, there's more of, of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. You're a humbug, I say. Humbug. Oh. Mercy. Dreadful apparition. Why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? I do. I must. But why do spirits walk the earth? And why do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world. Oh, oh woe is me. And witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth and turn to happiness. You are fettered. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on of my own free will and of my own free will I wore it. Is its pattern familiar to you? Or would you know the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself? It was as full as heavy as this seven Christmas Eves ago, and you have added to it since. It is a ponderous chain. Jacob? Oh, oh, Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give. It comes from above the regions of Anitra's Scrooge, and is conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of men. Nor oh, can I tell you what I could. A very little more is all that is permitted to me. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me, in life my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole. And weary journeys lie before me. I have no rest, no peace, only the incessant torture of remorse. Remorse? Oh, but you were not a bad man, Jacob. You were a good man of business. Business? Business. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. At this rolling time of the year, I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds with my eyes turned down? And I lift them, raise them to the blessed star which led the wise men to a poor abode. Were there no poor homes to which its light would have conducted me? Hear me, Ebenezer, my time is almost gone. I will, but don't be hard on me, Jacob, pray. How it is I appear before you in a shape that you can see, I may not tell. I have sat invisible beside you many and many a day. Well, that's not an agreeable idea. That's no light part of my penance. I am here tonight to warn you that you may have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. Oh, you are always a good friend, Jacob. Thank you. You will be haunted by three spirits. I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow at the stroke of one. Expect the second on the next night at the same time. And expect the third on the next night when the last stroke of 12 has ceased to vibrate. Couldn't I take them all at once and, and have it over with, Jacob? Look to see me no more. And look that for your own sake, you remember what has passed between us. Jacob, are you a dream, Jacob? Come. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was 
for our Christmas day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Well, the clock. Why, it was past two when I went to bed. The clock must be wrong. An icicle must have got into the works. Is it possible that I have slept through the day and into another night? Is it? Is it possible that something has happened to the sun and this is 12 noon? No, not possible. The quarter hour. Marley said one o'clock. Half past. A quarter two. The hour itself and nothing else. Are you the spirit whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who or, or what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. Rise and come with me. It would have been in vain for Scrooge to plead that the weather and the hour were not adapted to pedestrian purposes. That bed was warm and the thermometer well below freezing, that he was clad only in his dressing gown and slippers, and they had a cold upon him at the time. The spirit's grasp, though gentle as a child's, was not to be resisted. They passed through the wall and stood upon an open country road. The city vanished, and with it the darkness and mist. But good heaven, I was bred in this place. I was a boy here. Your lip is trembling, and what is that upon your cheek? A blemish, that's all. Lead on, spirit. Take me where you will. Do you recollect the way? Remember it. Why, I could walk it blindfold. Strange to have forgotten it for so many years. I recognize Let us go on. every gate and every tree. Those boys in great spirits. I know those boys. Hello, Tom. Hello. These are but the shadows of things that have been. They have no consciousness of us. My, my, my old school, the school I was sent away to when I was a boy. The school is not quite deserted, even at Christmas time. Look, a solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. Yeah, yes, I see him. Poor boy. I wish. But it's too late now. What is the matter? Nothing, nothing. Uh, uh, there, there was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I, I should have liked to have given him something, that's all. Someone's coming. Dear, dear brother, I've come to bring you home, dear brother. To bring you home, home, home. Home, little man? Yes, home for good and all. Home forever and ever. Father is so much kinder than he used to be that home's like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one night when I was going to bed that I was not afraid to ask him once more if he might come home. And he said, yes, you should, and sent me in a coach to bring you. And you are never to come back here, and we'll all be together for Christmas and have the merriest time in all the world. You are a wonder, little fan. I'll get my things. Always a delicate creature whom a breath might blow away. But what a great heart. Yes, a great heart. And she lived to be a woman, did she not? And had children? One child. True, your nephew. Yes. Come, see if you know this place. Know it? Was I not apprenticed here? Why, it's old Fezziwig. Bless his heart, it's, it's Fezziwig alive again. Yo ho there, Ebenezer. Ned. Ned Wilkins, to be sure. Bless me, yes, there he is. Oh, he was much attached to me, was Ned. Poor oh, Ned, dear, dear. Yo ho, my boys, no more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Ned. Christmas, Ebenezer. Now, let's have the shutters up. Billy ho, clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here. Lots of room, for sure, my lads. We need lots of room to kick up our heels. Mr. Fezziwig, will you be my partner for the first dance? I should be delighted, Mrs. Fezziwig. Come, Ned. 
You heard, Father. No more work tonight. Henry, will you dance around with me? Dancing? But Mother made a ginger cake. Aren't we to have the cake now? First to dance, Henry. Then some cake. And you've already had cake, Henry. I saw you snitching when Mother was icing it. Look, he still has icing on his chin. Now I might not want to dance with you. Your fingers might be sticky. Ah, oh, well, sticky fingers, sticky chin. They only make my boy a little sweeter. Well done, Mr. Fezziwig. Are we to have another round? <laughs> well, but of course, my boy. Uh, whew, as soon as I get my wind back. <laughs> and after he has some cake and pie to make sure he has his strength back. Now, I made a ginger cake, which as Henry can attest is most sweet and tasty, and mince pies and apple tarts. You have only to tell me which treat you fancy. Henry has convinced me. I'll have the cake. I fancy the mince pie, Mistress Fezziwig. I fancy all three, mother. (laughs) Then all three you shall have, my sweet, since it's Christmas. Come, all of you, let's gather round the table. A small matter to make these silly folks full of gratitude. Small? He was a good master. It was in his power to make us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. Say that his power lay in words and looks, in being so slight that it is impossible to add them up and count them. But then, the happiness he gave was quite as great as it had cost a fortune. What's the matter? Nothing particular. Something, I think. No. No, I I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now, that's all. My time grows short. Quick. It matters little. To you, very little. Another idol has displaced me. And if it can cheer and comfort you in time to come, I, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? A golden one. This is the even-handed dealing of the world. There is nothing in which it is so hard as poverty. And there is nothing which it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. I do not condemn you, Ebenezer, but you pursue wealth too fiercely. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion, greed, engrosses you. Have I not? What then? Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? I am not changed towards you. Am I? Our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so. You are changed. When it was made, you were another man. I was a boy. And perhaps it was only that boy who loved me. How often and how keenly I have thought of this, I will not say. But I have thought of it. And I know I must release you. Have I ever sought release? In words, no. Never. In what then? In a changed nature, an altered spirit, in everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. If this contract were not already between us, tell me, would you seek me out now? You think not. I would gladly think otherwise if I could. But if you were free today, tomorrow, Can I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl? No. And so, with a full heart, for the love of him who you once were, I release you. May you be happy in the life that you have chosen. Spirit, show me no more. I cannot bear it. She saw you once later, did you know? Many years later with husband and children in tow. She passed by your shop at night and saw you sitting in the window. She felt sorry to think of you so alone in the world. Spirit, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you delight to torture me? 
I told you, these are but shadows of things that have been. Do not blame me that they are what they are. Return to your bed, Ebenezer. As this vision faded, Scrooge was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness and further of being in his own bedroom. And he had barely had time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep, but a sleep that was not to last long. One o'clock, and no shape appears. Could it all have been a dream? <laughs> come, Ebenezer, come close and know me better. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. You have never seen the like of me before. Never? Well, you ought to look. come with me, Ebenezer, out into the world. Are you ready? Spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. <laughs> then touch my robe, and let us fly. Where are we bound? Ask no questions. Observe, friend Scrooge, observe. <laughs> but where are we headed? Where? Into the city streets on Christmas morning. Mark me. We will see some Christmas cheer. Oh, nothing very cheerful in the climate of this town. And yet, there is an air of cheerfulness abroad that the clearest summer air and the brightest summer sun might endeavor to diffuse and be. Look about you, Ebenezer. What do you see? I'm not certain what I see. You are seeing joy, my friend. Joy within them all, rich and poor alike. God love it. Man was not meant to quarrel in such a day as this. God love it, and so it is. This is a side of the city I have never seen before. Because you do not pause to look, my friend. But come, we cannot tarry. On we go. Where to now? To the home of your nephew, your late sister's only child. <laughs> he said Christmas was a humbug. As I live, he believed it too. More shame for him, Fred. He's a comical old fellow. That's the truth. And not so pleasant as he might be, but his offenses carried their own punishment. And I have nothing to say against him. Is he really very rich, Fred? Oh, I'm sure he is. But what of that? His wealth is of no use to him. He doesn't do any good with it. He doesn't make himself comfortable with it. <laughs> he, he doesn't have the satisfaction of thinking that he's ever going to benefit us with it. <laughs> I have no patience with him. None at all. Oh, I have. I'm, I'm sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers by his ill whims? Himself, always. Here he takes it into his head to dislike us. What are the consequences? He misses a good dinner, loses some pleasant moments, which could do him no harm. I'm sure he loses pleasanter companions than he can find in his own thoughts, either in his moldy old office or his dusty chambers. Well, perhaps he thinks we expect something more from him than we do. Perhaps he does. It's a shame, though. He is, after all, the only family that I have. I know, my dear, but what can we do? Perhaps nothing. But I mean to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. He may rail at Christmas till he dies, but he can't help thinking better of it. I defy him if he finds me going there in good temper year after year and saying, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? And a Merry Christmas to you, sir. If it only puts him in the vein to leave his poor clerk 50 pounds, that is something. But in his own way, he has given us plenty of merriment, I am sure, and it would be ungrateful of us not to drink to his health at dinner this evening. Yes, a glass of mulled wine to toast my Uncle Scrooge. Yes, to Uncle Scrooge. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man, wherever he is. He won't take it from me, but he may have it nevertheless. Uncle Scrooge. 
Come, Ebenezer, come. Where to now, spirits? To the home of your clerk. Bob Cratchit? Oh, whatever for. He is but a poor man and of little interest to me. But he is of great interest to me. My concern is for all men, poor men more, most, because they need more than most. Mrs. Cratchit is laying the table for dinner. Whatever has got your precious father then, and tiny Tim, and Martha weren't as late last Christmas day. Here's Martha, mother. Here's Martha, Here's Martha mother. mother. Hurrah! You're such a good Martha. I bless your heart, my dear, how late you are. We had a deal of work to finish up last night and had to clear away this morning. Well, never mind as long as you come. Sit ye down by the fire, my dear, and get warmed. Lord bless ye. Where's father and tiny Tim? They're both to church. They'll be here soon. Here they come now. Hide, Martha, hide. The child is crippled. Yes, he is. I never knew. There is much you have not known, Ebenezer. Uh, but where's our Martha? Not coming. Not coming? Not coming on Christmas Day? <laughs> now wash up all of you and we'll have dinner. And how did Tiny Tim behave? As good as gold and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful, sitting by himself so much, and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hoped the people saw him in church, because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember on Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Each day I pray. I have faith, Bob, that we will have our own miracle, that our little boy will one day grow strong and hearty. And I, mother, and I. Ah, <laughs> uh, was there ever such a Christmas goose? Was there ever, ever such a Christmas goose indeed? It's more like a Christmas chicken, it's so scrawny and small. But they do not seem to notice everything. You'll hear no complaints here. Mother, this is delicious. Everything is wonderful, Mother. Even better than last year. Come, the Christmas punch. A toast. A toast on Christmas Day. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. Bless us, God everyone. Spirit, what of the child? Tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat in the chimney corner and a crutch without an owner carefully preserved. Spirit. You, you cannot mean. If these shadows of the future remain unaltered by the future, this child will die. No, 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 kind spirit, say if, he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race will find him here. But what then, if he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Mr. Scrooge, I give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I'd hope he have a good appetite for it. Uh, my dear, the children, Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I am sure, on which one drinks to the health of such a stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you, poor fellow. My dear, Christmas Day. I'll drink to his health for your sake and the days, but not for his. A long life to him. Merry Christmas and a happy new year. He'll be very merry and happy, I have no doubt, to Mr. Scrooge. Mr. Scrooge. The mention of my name casts a shadow on their party. It will pass, as it does at this moment. <laughs> Interesting, is it not? There is nothing of high mark in this family. They are not handsome. They are not well-dressed. Indeed, there is little with all except each other. Interesting is it not that they could be so happy? I don't understand. No, no, you do not, not yet. But come, my friend, 
The time is getting dark. My hour draws nigh. Your spirit's life so short. My life upon this globe is very short. It ends tonight. Tonight? Tonight, at midnight. Hark, my time is drawing near. But where to now, spirit? Nowhere, Ebenezer, and everywhere. To a sick bed, to a miner's hut, to an almshouse, to a jail, wherever I am needed on this night. Look, look, Ebenezer, look down here. Uh, they're pitiful. Are they yours? They are man's. They cling to me, appealing from their fathers. This boy is ignorance. This girl is want. Beware of them both in all of their degrees. But most of all, beware of this boy. For I see written on his brow, that which is doom. Have they no refuge or resource? <laughs> Are there no prisons? <laughs> Are there no workhouses? <laughs> I, I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. You are about to show me shadows of things that have not yet happened, but will happen in the time before us. Is that so, spirit? Ghost of the future. I fear you more than any specter I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear you company. Lead on. The night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me, I know. Lead on, spirit. No, I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. When did he die? Last night, I believe. Why? What was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. What's he done with the money? I haven't heard. Left it to his company, perhaps. He hasn't left it to me, that's all I know. <laughs> it's likely to be a very cheap funeral. For upon my life, I don't know of anybody to go to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. I don't mind going if lunch is provided. If I'm going to do it, I must be fed. <laughs> <laughs> what shadows are these? What am I seeing? Let's see. Let's see then. I'm sure we haven't all met here for nothing. Better be faced then. <laughs> what odds, dearie? And what odds? Every person has a right to take care of himself. He always did. That's true indeed. No man more so. Why then, don't stand there staring as if you was a afraid, woman. Who's the wiser? You're not going to pick holes in each other's coats, I suppose. If he wanted to keep him after he was dead, the wicked old screw, why wasn't he more natural when he was alive? If he had been, he'd have had somebody to look after him when he was struck with death, said a lion gasping out his last there alone by himself. It's the truest words ever spoke. It's a judgment on him. I wish it was a little heavier judgment, and it should have been you may depend on it if I could have laid my hands on anything else. All right, what have you then? Let us see. A seal, a pencil case, a pair of sleeve buttons, a brooch of no great value, mind you, two silver teaspoons. Now, them's not bad. And mine. What do you call this? Bed curtains? Aye, bed curtains. You don't mean to say you took them down rings and all with them a lion there. Yes, I do. Why not? You were born to make your fortune, Marty, and you'll certainly do it. <laughs> and don't you overlook the blankets now. His blankets? Who else is Jeff think? He isn't likely to take cold with that, I dare say. Then let's hope he didn't die of anything catching, eh? <laughs> Spirit, they have robbed a dead man. They have... Picked a dead man's bones. And look at this shirt, if you will. Looks how your eyes ache, and, then, and you'll not find a threadbare spot. And they'd have wasted it, mind, if not for me. What do you call wasting it? 
for thy very diminished when rags are due as well. Here's an end to it then, and a tidy profit it'll be. <laughs> he did little good in all his life, but you can't say that now he's dead. He's done just fine by us, hasn't he? <laughs> oh, oh, spirit, I, I see, I, I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. Oh, spirit, this is a fearful place. Fearful people. Tell me, must death be like this? Is there never tenderness connected with a death? The color hurts my eyes. They're better now. It must be the candlelight that makes them weak, but I wouldn't show weak wise to your father when he comes home for all the world. It must be near his time. I have known him walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder, very fast indeed. And so have I. So have I when he carried our Tim, but he was very light to carry. And father loved him so that it was no trouble. Quiet. No trouble. Quiet. Here comes your father now. You come late, my love. I had begun to worry. I, I visited the churchyard on my way to be with Tiny Tim for just a while. It did give me good to see again what a peaceful place it is. It will be so green come spring. <laughs> oh, my little child. My little, little child. Do not grieve, Father. It's Christmas. Tim would not wish it, Father. I know. I know. I'm, I'm just a little down, you know. I, I met Mr. Scrooge's nephew in the street. He said he was sorry to hear our sad news and prayed he might be of help to us in some way. He has such a kind way about him. It really seemed he had known our tiny Tim and felt with us. I am sure he is a kind soul. Yeah, he gave me his card and urged me come round to see him. He said he'd like to help find a situation for Peter. Only hear that, Peter. Before we know it, Peter will be keeping company with someone and setting up for himself. Get along with you. It will happen one day, Peter. <laughs> but there's plenty of time for that. One day all my little birds must fly the nest. My dears, I know that however and whenever we part from one another, we will always be together in our hearts. And none of us will forget our tiny Tim, shall we? Or this first parting that there was among us. No, no. Of course not, Father. <laughs> when we recollect how patient and how mild he was, although he was a little, little child, we shall never quarrel amongst ourselves and forget poor tiny Tim in doing it. Never, Father. No, no. I am very, very happy this day. Doctor, something informs me that the moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me who the man was that died so wretched and alone. The man whom no one mourned. Before I drop nearer to that stone to which you point, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of things that will be? Or are they shadows of things that may be only? Mm. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which, if persevered, they must lead. But if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say it's thus with what you show me. My name, my name upon the stone, no spirit, no, no spirit, hear me. I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been before tonight. Why show me this if I have passed all hope? Good spirit, your, your nature intercedes for me and pities me. Tell me that I may yet change these shadows you have showed me. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will not shut out the lessons learned this night. Oh, tell me I may sponge away the writing on this stone. My, my, my blankets have not been sold. 
My bed curtains have not been torn down, rings and all, they, they are here. I am here. The shadows of things that would have been may be dispelled. They will be, I, I know they will. Oh, I'm, I'm as light as a feather. I'm as happy as an angel. I'm as merry as a schoolboy. I don't know what day of the month it is. I don't know how long I've been among the spirits. I, I don't know anything. I'm quite a baby. Never mind, I don't care. I'd rather be a baby. Uh, hello? Whoop, hello out there. What's today? What's today, my fine fellow? Today? Why Christmas Day? It's Christmas Day. I haven't missed it. Oh, the spirits have done it all in one night. Oh, they can do anything they like. Of course they can. Hello, my fine fellow. Do you, do you know the poulterers on the corner? I sure hope I do. Oh, an intelligent boy. A remarkable boy. Uh, do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? What? The one as big as me? It's hanging there now. Oh, yeah. Here, here, here. Go and hurry and go and buy it. And I will send it to the Cratchit house. Oh, and here's the address. And don't you tell them who sent it, mind. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Here's a shilling for your trouble, lad. Wait, 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 wait. Here's more. Uh, take a coach, my lad, to deliver it all the sooner. Oh. Oh. My dear ladies, how do you do? I hope you succeeded in your kind mission yesterday. A Merry Christmas to you both. Mr. Scrooge? Oh, yeah, yes. That, that is my name, and I, I fear it may not be pleasant to you. Allow me to ask your pardon for the way I behaved yesterday. And will you have the goodness to accept this? Lord, bless me, my dear Mr. Scrooge, can you be serious? Oh, yes, I am, my dear lady. Take it. Take it. Oh, a good many back payments are included, I assure you. Mr. Scrooge, I, I hardly know what to say. Oh, nothing to say, madam, but Merry Christmas. Oh, and you may you put all of this to good use. Good morning, my dear. Is my nephew at home? Oh, why, yes. Uncle Scrooge? Yes, my dear uncle, it is. Why... Bless my soul, who's this? Oh, it's, it's I, Fred, your Uncle Scrooge. I've come to dinner, will you let me in? My, my dear uncle, of course you may come in. Let him in? Why, of course we let him in. He literally welcomed us with open arms. And it was a wonderful day, filled with wonderful games and harmony and wonderful happiness. But even this new Scrooge was at the office early the next day. He was there very early. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he'd set his heart upon. And he did. Yes, he did. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. He was a full 18 minutes behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come in. His hat was off before he reached the door. He was on the stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen, as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello. What do you mean, coming here at this time of day? I I'm very sorry, sir. I know I'm late, sir. You are? Uh, yes, I think you are. Step this way, sir, if you please. It's only one day a year, sir. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now I'll tell you what, my friend. I'm not pleased with the state of affairs as they have been in this office. And I'm not going to stand for it any longer. And therefore, I'm going to raise your salary. 
Merry Christmas, Bob. A merrier Christmas, Bob, than I have given you in many a year. I'll, I'll raise your salary and endeavor to help your struggling family. And well, we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over our Christmas bowl of smoking bishop. Um, oh, now, uh, make up the fires and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all, and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city ever knew, or as any other city or town in the world ever knew. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh and little heeded them. His own heart was filled with laughter, and that was the only laughter that he heard. And it was always said of him, ever afterwards, that he knew how to keep Christmas well. If many a man alive possessed that knowledge, may that be truly said of us, and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed. God bless us, everyone. Here we come, caroling the monthly serene. Here we come, caroling so fair to be seen. Blood and joy come to you, and to you a Christmas cheer. And God bless you and send you a happy new year. And God send you a happy new year. We are not daily beggars that get from door to door. We are your neighbor's children whom you have seen before. Love and joy come to you, and to you our Christmas too. And God bless you and send you a happy new year. And God send you a happy new year. And God bless and bless you and bless us as the wives and sisters too. And all the little children that are on the table, love and joy come to you, and to you our Christmas too. And God bless you and send you a happy new year, and God send you a 